So today I want to encourage you. Today is not about condemnation because in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. We're all on a journey from A to B. And church is the vehicle for us to grow together. But sometimes we have to ask the hard questions so that we can grow. That's what Paul was doing. He planted Galatia. So he went on his missionary tour. There's three years that he went through this journey. And one of the places he passed through was the, the place called Galatia. And there were Galatians in there, and he started a church, house church. And they were meeting together. And then he left, kept going on his journey. But as he was going through his journey, he hears some backstories about Galatia after he left. So the book of Galatians is really about Paul as the father of the church, speaking to the church that he planted, the people, his brothers and sisters. But he has a sense of urgency because he hears about this news and he's upset. Now, mind you, back then, there was no internet, there's no Instagram, there was no Telegram, there's no Facebook. So by the time it got, the news got to him, he knew there was some time already of the things that were happening outside of what, how, what, what he knew. So he was very alarmed that this was already percolating. It didn't just happen yesterday. It's like, okay, that's been weeks. Because mail would come to him to parcel. So now he's thinking, not only are they thinking this way, but it's been a while since I've been there. And they're not having a TV camera that he can speak to the Galatian church. So what he does is he writes a letter. His audience is the Galatian church. I'm just talking about the book of Galatians. There's six chapters. It's one of the shortest epistles, one of the shortest letters from Paul, because it's very direct. Not a, he, he's actually upset in it. So if I sound upset, that's really just because of Paul. I blame him. <laughs> Why? Because there's an urgency. It's not because he's mad at them. He's just concerned. It is direct. It is aggressive. The book of Galatians is very different from the other books. But you have to understand why. It wasn't just because Paul was a mad person, uh, angry. No, there was a reason. His kids, the church, was having an issue, and he wanted to address that. The issue was a group of Judaizers, which is Jewish Christians. So Christians, they believed in Jesus, but they would have Jewish tradition some of them had come into that church and began to teach another gospel. Paul shared with the Galatians that if you believe in Jesus by faith alone, you will be saved. Amen? Jesus plus nothing. But these this teachers who have come in had said, well, you also have to be circumcised. During that time, in the Jewish community, circumcision was a form of submission to God. It's an external act of yielding. And all the men said, wow. So now, these adult Galatians were being taught that you need to circumcise yourself, plus Jesus, plus follow the law. But, but believe in Jesus. But follow the law. Some, some years ago, I was invited to this church. It didn't, it didn't, I was single. Okay, waiver. Disclaimer here. And it didn't help that the person who invited me was a, a young lady who was very attractive. So I'm sitting in a coffee shop, and she approached me. Why would somebody approach me? I don't know. Uh, you look at this, I don't, I don't understand. So she approached me and she said, hey, I want to invite you to church. I'm thinking, church is great. Because at this point, I was, I was a believer. She said, yeah, we have this church and I want you to come. I said, sure, tell me where it is and I'll go. Now, mind you, I was really motivated by how she looked. Okay, I'll just be honest. I was 18, all right, just, just letting you know. 
So she gave me so much attention, I'm thinking, this must be good. So I go to the church. We sit in the very front. So she's sitting with me. She saved me a seat. We're sitting there. And she says, okay, this is a church. Lots of people. And I look at the stage. There's no instruments. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe it's a, a minus one, a karaoke singing of worship. I'm not sure. Sometimes you have that, right? If you don't have a place. So, so they started singing, but it's a cappella. It's Acapulco, okay? So there's no instruments. They're just singing. I'm looking at the words of the songs. I don't know the songs. And there's no mention of Jesus, which is fine. Some of our songs have no mention of Jesus. Amazing grace. Somebody came up to me and said, Tong, you know, some of the songs you sing, that's just kind of vague. Let's sing Amazing Grace together. We're not talking about Jesus. We're talking about his grace which implies that there's Jesus in there. I'm just, I'm just saying, not all songs have to have God in it. Sometimes it's a sentiment or the attitude. So that's okay. So I'm looking at the songs. I'm thinking, okay, fine. You know, we sing the song. It's, it was great. So we stopped at the end, and then the person start, somebody came up and started sharing, and they shared that in order for you to be saved, you must be baptized. That's in the Bible, actually, in Peter. But the way he was saying it was for you to be saved, you must believe and be baptized. So in my mind, I'm going back. Wait, isn't it just Jesus alone? And after that, there's a public confession of my belief, then I get baptized. But it's very tricky because the way he said it was, you need to believe in Jesus and be baptized. And it's a Bible. He read it. And I read that and I'm going... Well, I don't, by that, at that time, I, I wasn't very good in the words. So I didn't know the background of what Peter was talking about. Sometimes you can take scripture, I saw Jesus, and you take it and then you interpret it, and you say, this is what it means. But you have to go exit Jesus where you say, what was the context of why Peter said that? To understand why he said it. But I was, I was green. I didn't know. I'm like, okay. So this, they said, today we're going to baptize people. And if you bat, get baptized and you believe, then you will be saved. And that's when I stood up. I said, as beautiful as she was, no thank you. Because something in me was not settled. Like, wait, it's almost true. Almost. But not true. You know... We all have a tendency to drift. It only takes a little bit. Nobody says, I'm just going to sin. I'm just, I'm just, no, you just kind of say to yourself, I think that's okay. Nobody's going to see. You see what I'm talking about? We, 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 bless me, we all have a tendency to drift. And this is what Paul was going through, was he was saying, okay, Galatians, I, I taught you the truth, but I think, you're, I think you're doing this. Okay? So, a group of people were telling the Galatians that they needed to be circumcised and follow the law. What is the importance of this? Well, Paul addressed this first real controversy that plagued the church in the early years. Now, mind you, it was already evident then, and it's still evident now, that we are fighting for the truth. But sometimes outside forces can, can add just a little bit, and then we are a little off. If you read Galatians, his close relationship is evident with the people because he is aggressive. His tone has a sense of urgency. You know, when you know somebody's in trouble, you're not going to be like, Hey, Bruce, I think what you're doing is not so good. Or, Bruce, man, I'm really concerned for you, right? Because I love him, and I want to pour out my heart, and I want to, want to say my peace. What's the big idea? Well, watch this. Justification comes to people through faith in Jesus Christ. Full stop. Justification before God comes from your faith in Jesus Christ. Full stop. Not by our works under the law. 
not by our works, so no one should boast. It is by grace, through faith, that you have been saved. It is a gift. In fact, the faith that you have to believe is a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I have faith. No, no. God gave you the faith to believe. So that no one would boast. Amazing, isn't it? Thank you, Jesus, that it's not up to us. Amen? What is the hope? Christians have been freed from the bondage of sinful nature and now have a path to holiness open through Christ by walking in the Spirit. Catch that last one. Our path to holiness is by walking in the Spirit. The first two chapters of Galatians, I'm just giving you an overview because to, for us to understand Galatians 5, we need to understand what he was talking about. So, the first two chapter, chapters, Paul defends his apostleship. He just goes for it. He just defends himself. This is who I am. This is what I've done. So, if you read to Galatians 1 and 2, you'll get to the chapter 2 when he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. The life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and set me free. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Say that with me. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives. That's a good prayer. Chapter 3, Paul points out the error. So he, he starts his letter. This is who I am. I'm going to establish my authority again. Chapter 3, he says, this is the problem. He calls it out. He says, there are people that are teaching you the wrong thing. You know what that is? Love. He loved them. The final chapters all makes it clear that justification, an act of grace through faith, need not result in a sinful lifestyle. Meaning, you're free, stay free. If God made you free, so stay free. Take it again. God made you free, so stay free. He made you free. You need to make sure you stay free. Can't do it without the Holy Spirit. Okay? So let's go to Galatians 5. Finally, we're in the chapter. We'll put it up here. Kaylee, do you have it? So I like the New Living Translation. Because it's easier for me to digest. Let's read it together and then I'm going I'm to pause. Okay, I'm going to do something that you shouldn't be doing when you're preaching. Cut, cut on the middle of a, a verse, okay? But I can't help it. So here we go. So Christ has truly set us free. Now, this has actually should have been in chapter 4. But it ended up in chapter 5. Because when you say so, that means you were talking about something. So now that I've said all of that, this is what I'm going to say now. So Christ has truly set us free. Full stop. God has made you free, so stay free. All right? Now make sure that you stay free. Oh, yeah, it's right there. Now make sure that you stay free. The onus is on us. God made you free. He set you free. Now you need to stay free. And don't get tied up again in the slavery to the law. What is he talking about there? If I was set in prison and I get out of prison, I shouldn't go back to prison. Paul was saying, 
I set you free. You walked out of prison. But as you were walking and I left you, you looked at another area there, and it looks like that's, that's pretty good right there, but you didn't know you were walking into prison bars again. So he's shining the light and saying, look, 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 that's not freedom over there. The Holy Spirit wants to work on us every day when we think about these things, when we're at the crossroads. Am I going to be free when I choose this? Stay free. Are you getting it? Listen. <laughs> Exclamation point. He's, he's pretty upset. He's saying, hey, 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 hey. Listen. Right? Uh, Paul, I, Paul, tell you this. He's, this is how probably it sounded like. It sounded like. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. If you're going to go back to the law and works, why do we need Christ? Because it's all up to you now. If I perform the rituals, then I will be free. Well, I thought Jesus set you free. This is what Paul is saying. He says, I'll say it again. So he was... <laughs> He repeated himself because it's very important. He says, if you are trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. Let's go to the next. For if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. Be powerful. You know what he's saying? If you want, you can do it on your own. To prove that you are free, but you don't need Christ, which means you've cut him off. You have cut him off. Do you ever want that to be said about you? You know, that song, he was cut off from Christ. No bueno, right? That's not good. He says, you have fallen away from God's grace. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. So Paul is going back and saying, there is a promise. It's the Holy Spirit. And he will make you right if you trust in him because we are of the Spirit. Paul is reminding him them of who they are. You are of the Spirit. Remember the story of my son? I said, let's, re let's rehearse who you are. Let's go back to the basics. It's not a matter of circumcision or cigars. It's a matter of your identity in Christ. Don't get caught up with the, mini, the small things. Just go back to who you are. Stand on it. Well, they, they were doing it. This is my son, 17. Everybody was smoking cigars. And he's not. He had to make a stand because of who he was. That's pretty hard for a 17-year-old. Calling his dad in the middle, like, can I smoke? You know, that's the risk he had to take for his own credibility. So I asked him, why did you call me? He says, I needed, uh, now that he's not 14 anymore, he's 24. He says, uh, 17. 17, he's 24 now. He says, the reason why I called you was I needed validation that maybe what I was thinking was not good and I should, I, I needed to hear somebody say that I was on the right path. So he already knew. He just needed somebody to kind of push him along. But I never addressed the cigar. And we had a, we had a, a, a conversation with my sons when they were young. I said, there's going to be things out there, but I want you to bring it home first. If it's cigarettes, alcohol, cigars, if you hear it from out there, don't do it out there with people that don't know what they're doing. Bring it in here and we'll talk about it. If you really want to smoke a cigarette, you really want to drink alcohol, let's drink it here in my house so then I can watch you. Talk about it. Why, why, if I say to him, I learned this from a very young age. If I told him no, whoa, that's a license to say yes. So I did the reverse. I said, if you ever want to do it, do it here at home. You pay for it. I'm not going to pay for it. 
but we can try it together. You let me know how it feels like. So then you're, there's the safety of failing and trying. Now, did they ever do that? I don't know. But the point I'm making is this. My house is safe. My heart is safe. I won't judge you. But I'd rather be in the light than not in the light. See what I'm saying? All right, enough of me. So we go back to here. For verse 6, for when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. So Paul was not really against circumcision because later on in some of the chapters, he talked about Titus being circumcised. But that's not, we're not going to go up to there right now. He's just saying in verse 6, it's not a matter of circumcision. That's not the point. The point is you're putting your faith in works and the law. What is important is faith. Now, I've, I've never seen this before until I was studying this. Faith is expressed in love. Isn't that amazing? Faith is expressed in love. See, Christ died to set us free from sin and a long list of laws and regulations. I am grateful. I don't have a list every day. Check. Check. Well, not so much. Check. Because I would have failed. In fact, that is what in chapter 3 they were talking about. The law is your tutor. Someone that's teaching you that you cannot do it by yourself. Christ came to set us free. Watch this. But not free to do whatever we want to do. Now I'm free in Christ. I can just do whatever I want to do. Uh, that's, not, that's, that's not what it means. Let's keep going. <clears throat> you were running the race so well. Back then, they had the games. There were games. So there was running. So they knew the, the metaphor he was using. This was the precursor to the Olympics. He says, you were running the race so well. Who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who called you to freedom. Watch this, verse 9. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. A few weeks ago, Richie was here banging on some dough. Remember that? He put a little bit of yeast. He kept banging it. My OCD was, I was watching, was, was hitting me. I'm like, Richie, you need, you, need, you need to keep kneading. You keep stopping. It's. It doesn't take very much for you to drift. It doesn't take very much for me to drift. We need to be humble lest we fall. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. I am trusting the Lord to keep you from believing false teachings. God will judge the person, whoever he is, who has been confusing you. He's so upset that he's actually cursing the guy. Paul was not happy. He was concerned. Let's go. Keep on. Dear brothers and sisters, if I were still preaching that you must be circumcised, as some say I do, why am I still being persecuted? So not only were they doing that, but they were throwing mud at Paul by saying, well, Paul teaches that while you're away, that you must be circumcised. So they lied against him as well, slandered him. So he's defending himself like, I'm not doing it. If I were no longer preaching salvation to the cross of Christ, no one would be offended. I just wish that those troublemakers who want to mutilate you by circumcision would mutilate themselves. Okay, Paul, that's a little bit too much. Dude, I thought we were supposed to love one another. There comes a time when you need to speak up. In love but firm. No, that's not the truth. That's what Paul is doing. He's saying, in his concern, he's saying, if they want to mutilate you, they should mutilate themselves. He's saying, no, we're not going to do that. Why 
would you listen to people that make you go back to prison of bondage? Why? I don't know what he was thinking, but I do know as a father, I would defend my kids with everything I have. I might lose my Christianity <laughs> if you touch my kids. You see what I'm saying? Paul, as a father, was looking at the church and saying, I got to fight for this. I don't care what they think. Keep going, Kaylee. Are you guys learning anything? All right. For, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. So this is what Paul was talking about. Crime, Christ came to set us free, not free to do whatever we want, because that would lead us back into slavery. Do you see the cycle? Now I'm free, so I can just follow my flesh. Well, if you follow your flesh because you're free, you're back into the bondage of sin. You see what I'm saying? But I'm free. No, that's not what Paul is saying. Watch this. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Wait, instead? Meaning, if you reverse that, if I use my freedom to satisfy my sinful nature, then I'm self-serving. I'm not serving others. You see the reverse? Because he says instead. Instead of serving yourself, how about you serve others? That's what he's saying. Use the freedom that God has for you and stop looking at your navel. And look outward to others. Use your freedom. See, this is, what, this is what struck me when I was reading this. God saved me from my selfishness so that I can be unselfish. You see what I'm saying? Why would you be saved and then go back to your selfish ways? Might as well just stay unsaved. Am I connecting here? This is what Paul is saying. For the whole law, verse 14, can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. He's talking within the church. If we're just picking fights with one another, if we're just going, rah, rah, I have a gift of criticism. I can criticize anyone at any time. I don't like that song. I can't worship with that thing. Ah. I don't like that preaching. Ah. He took my last bagel. Ah. <laughs> we do it to ourselves here. It's called judgment. The critical spirit. We brought it in here. We have to be careful. By, because if we, we're biting and devouring one another, beware of destroying one another. You know what the issue is when you become self-centered and you follow the law and you cut yourself from Christ? We kill each other. We eat each other up because he's called devour. We bite each other. We, we go back to our flesh. Make sense? That's what he's saying. I'm not saying. I'm reading it. Right? Let's keep going. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. So now he switch, S, switches. He says, this is how you do it. If you do not want to bite one another, if you want to live where you're free, if you want to stay free because God made you free, then you need, need to God, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting. You know where the war is? Here. Here. Fighting each other so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. My brother, I need you. I'm going to stand here because you're so tall. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Tell them your name, my brother. Tell them your name. 
My name's Tim Slim. I told you to get down there. <laughs> this is, <laughs> I can't see through his fro. This is Kingston. Kingston, you're going to be the Holy Spirit. No, yeah, let's do it. Okay, he's the Holy Spirit. My brother. Over here, sir. Tell them your name. Jeremiah, turn around. Jeremiah, he's going to be the flesh. I'm sorry, we're just going to use this. You're not really the flesh. I'm just using an example. He is the flesh, and he is the Holy Spirit. You are always at the crossroads. Am I going to partner with my brother? So it's going to be fun. It's going to be great. We're going to feel good. We're going to do things that are not so good. But it's going to be great. Or can you just kind of guide me along here? Because it's hard. Yes? Yes. <laughs> but, but. Just for a little, I'll just have a little bit of, nobody's going to see. It's, it, it's okay. No, all right, all right, right. But I, it's hard. It's, it's hard. And um, I'm, I'm, sometimes I don't see you. I, I just keep going and, and you're not there. Uh, but I guess I need to, what Paul is saying is, you need to guide me. You need to, you need to guide me. You need to block for me so that, yes, that's it. Box out. That's it. But, 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 um, it's in my thoughts. I, we're, we're going to go. It's, it's okay. I'll, tomorrow, when I wake up, I'll do quiet time. And then, is that okay? No. Holy Spirit calls me back. He says, no, no, can't be. Do you want me? Yes. Of course. The sinful nature is strong. It's strong. So this is the battle. Do you see it? Now, it's also a mistake to say, I'm just going to do it on my own, and whenever I need the Holy Spirit, I'll turn around. But by that time, when I keep doing it on my own, it's just a little bit off, and then now I'm, I don't see him anymore. I need to be right. I can't take him along. I have to let him guide me. <laughs> yeah, don't leave me. You got to go. <laughs> there you go. But sometimes somebody said something really bad and I wanted to punch his face. I just want to. No. <laughs> this is. Thank you. Can you give them a hand? <laughs> this is our struggle. This is what Paul is saying. He's not talking about circumcision of the law. He says you need to be guided by the Spirit. There are many things spoken about the Holy Spirit through the years. Charismatics, non-charismatics, evangelicals, everybody's been talking about the Holy Spirit. What they're missing, we're, we're all caught up in the manifestations of the Spirit and speaking in tongues and the prophetic and all that. We're missing the person of the Holy Spirit who's supposed to guide us because He is God the Spirit. Let's not get caught up with circumcision or cigars or speaking in tongues. Let's get caught up with, am I being guided by the Holy Spirit? Because the more you say, I don't know about the Holy Spirit, you've just come here. Because you trust, Naomi spoke this, this morning, you trust in your own understanding. I don't get the Holy Spirit, so I'm going to trust myself. So you come to Jeremiah's side. Jeremiah, I'm just using your name. You're not, you're not evil. So I'm, I trust here. When you trust in your own understanding, you're walking away from the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We're now able to do what was impossible if you uh, guide by the Spirit. You can live unselfishly. Live each day controlled and guided by the Holy Spirit. Each day.
when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Let's keep going and we'll finish this up. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. I don't like this verse. Because I see myself in this verse. I have no escape. You don't have to guess. There's a lot. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy. Even if I take all of that out and I get to this last part, which I do day on a daily, outburst of anger. I still struggle with that. Selfish ambition. What about me? What about me? Dissension. I, I don't agree with that. I, I don't want. I don't want to agree with that. Or division, where you just, nope. Envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. There's more. He just didn't have space. He kept going. If you live by the flesh, there is chaos and pain and depression. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Forgive us, Father. Paul describes two forces fighting within us, the Holy Spirit and, his sinful, and our sinful nature. If we rely on our own wisdom, we will make the wrong choices. If we try to follow the Spirit on our human effort, we will also fail. If you try to follow the Spirit on your own human effort, you're also going to fail. It's not a matter of willpower. It's a matter of submission. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to, quiet everybody. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to follow the Spirit. I'm going to do it. It's all on, it's your back on yourself again. How about this? I'm done. <laughs> take it. I, I, take me, Lord. I don't know what to do. I don't trust myself. I don't like myself in the morning. The, 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 the part of me that nobody sees, I don't like it. Yielding and surrendering to the Holy Spirit is the, the way that he would guide you. Next, Kaylee, thank you very much. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. Let's build you up again. Watch this. In this verse, he's not talking about fruits. He's talking about a kind of fruit. I'll go to that in a moment. The kind of fruit in our lives, love, which is interesting, he starts with that. If you are, I'll, I'll do the reverse. If you are unloving or unlovable, you're living here. But if you have love that comes out, even when you're offended or things happen, you're living here. This is the sniff test. You're sniffing yourself out. Where am I living? He says joy. Now joy is something that you cannot produce. It is something that is given to you. You can produce happiness, but you cannot produce joy. It is a gift. It's a fruit of when you abide with Christ and believe his word and you obey his word and you do it with following the spirit, you will have joy. It's, it's a product. It's a fruit. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. And self-control. If you do not have any of those, you're over here. 
And you need to let the Holy Spirit work on you to go back here. Do you see what Paul is saying? If you abide, John 14, verse 5, if you abide in me, remain in me, and I in you, you will bear my fruit. I am the vine, and you are the branches. To remain in Christ would produce you that kind of fruit. He's talking about singular kind of fruit because he's not talking about the fruits. He's kind, talking about the kind of fruit, the one fruit. It's called abiding in Christ. If you abide in Christ, you will have that kind of fruit. How do we abide in Christ? We need to let the Holy Spirit guide us. Are you okay? There is no law against these things. Verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed their passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in, what's the word? Every, what's the next word? Part, what's the next word? Of our lives. Any more clear than that? This is what Paul is saying. If, we are, if we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. In another translation, it says, keep in step with the Spirit. Every part. If we want the fruit of the Spirit to grow in us, we must join our life to Him. Amen? We must know Him. We must love Him. We must remember Him. And we must imitate Him. We must daily commit our sinful tendencies to God's control. Daily. For me, it's moment to moment. Daily crucify yourself. Moment by moment, draw on the Spirit's power. Draw on the Spirit's power. Draw on the Spirit's power. There was a, there was a movement a few years ago of talking about the Spirit. It says, dunamis, power. We have the Holy Spirit. We've got power. And I go, I like that. It's very appealing. But can I do that on a daily, quietly, by myself, drawing on the power of the Spirit? Drawing on the power of the Spirit. Going to that well, taking a bucket of water and drinking it. Taking a bucket, taking a glass, drinking it. We can talk all we want, raising our fist about the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit, but it's on the daily that we need to work on it. We must daily commit our sinful tendencies to God's control. Let us not become conceited. Conceited means all you think about is you and your selfie. You know what conceited means? It's all about you. Or provoke one another. Not, not, it's just not about you. Now you're going to provoke somebody else. Or be jealous of another. You know, I give you a warning as a friend. Don't put too much talk on superstar ministers. They're just people saved by grace. We need to pray for them. Don't be jealous of people like, oh, I love his gifts, or I love her gifts, or she's amazing this. And once you start down that road, you're back here, man. You're back here. Again, Naomi shared today, you have a gift God has given you and a calling for yourself. That's unique. 
Let me give you a quick summary and then we're done. That's the end of the book, isn't it? That's the end of the chapter? Okay, we're not going to go to Galatians 6. We don't have time, so we're stuck. Let me read you something. Paul was not damning anyone. He wasn't accusing anybody, nor I do you. We're reading scripture, and we're reading it in the context of what it was written. And sometimes it sounds really, really strong because there was a concern that some were not running the race. Okay? The Galatians were in a crossroads, either to live by the flesh and the law or to live by the spirit and the truth. All, Holy Spirit, we need you now. We need you now. Okay, here we go. Paul was urging them to take the path of the spirit and faith, the trust in Christ alone. The spirit-led life is living all of life by the spirit. Let me repeat that. The title of this message is Living in the Spirit. The spirit-led life is living all of life by the Spirit. Living by the Spirit means to be led by the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit, living, leading in every part of our lives and sowing in the Spirit. Because what you sow, you will reap. If you sow in the flesh, you will reap in the flesh. Living the Spirit-led life means rejecting the desires of the flesh and crucifying our passions and desires of the sinful nature to the cross of Christ. Paul was not damning anyone. He was calling up the Galatians to take a hard and serious look at their lives. The flesh creates chaos, disunity, and harm. The fruit of the Spirit offers virtues and attitudes that demonstrate a life yielded to God. It comes down to this, self-centered life versus God-centered life. Self-centered life versus other-centered life. Because he said the greatest of the commandment is to love one another as you love yourself. Here's the test. You ready for the test? We're going to close with this. We know we are walking in step with the Spirit when we put others first. We know we're walking in step with the Spirit when we share. <laughs> Guys, need to, we need to share. Share your prayers. Share your finances. Share your time. Share your convictions. Share the gospel. Share a hug. Share a smile. Share your chair beside you. Share an encouragement. Don't wait for it. Give it. Give it. We know we are walking in step with the Spirit when we forgive. If there is something in you that's still unforgiven, brother and sister, it's hard. I have to deal with this in a personal daily to forgive. I don't make it about me and what I can't have. I was talking to a friend earlier. I don't want to focus. She said, I don't want to focus on the things that I do not have. I want to focus on the things that I have. Man, that hit me hard. We know we're walking in step with the Spirit when we love our enemies. They're not your enemies. They're the enemies of Christ. Love them. It's not easy. Last word. The redemptive work of Christ and the Spirit turns us outwards in goodness towards others. <laughs>